Hey beautiful people, welcome to my channel. My name is Busisiwe Lamini Harori, the Kempeth Principal. If you haven't subscribed already to my channel, may you please press the subscribe button there at the bottom and also click on the notification bell so that every time when I upload a video, you can be notified and be the first one to check it out. So today, uh, what we are going to do, we are going to talk about the samples that are received in a chemical pathology lab. So the first type of sample that we receive, which is the most early received um, sample, it is the blood sample. And with this blood sample, we can um, either use it as whole blood or as um, plasma or serum. So basically by a whole blood, I mean uh, when the blood is not separated as it is, as it comes out of the body of the sample. So it means that blood is not being centrifuged, so it's mixed thoroughly. So that what, what we call whole blood. So it means you'll be having your white cells, red blood cells, and your plasma as well included there. And then, like I said, we also receive either serum or plasma. So what is the difference between serum and plasma? So what plasma is, it is that liquid part, a uh, part of your blood, but this one contains all the clotting factors. So it has clotting factors and serum, it will be still that liquid part of the, of your blood, but it does not have clotting factors. So if we were to draw a tube that contains a blood sample, so this will be your tube, and what you would do, uh, we would uh, centrifuge it, and then when we centrifuge or spin down the sample, then the blood will separate into its components. So the components of blood, which mostly will be there, as we know, the red cells, which are responsible for the color of the blood, which is red, and then there will be like a little layer, which is a buffy coat, which contains your white cells and platelets. And then the top part basically will be your plasma, which is that liquid part. Plasma or serum, depending whether that they, they is clotting factors or they are not clotting factors. So we'll use RBC for red blood cells. And then here on the buffy code, you will have your white blood cells and your platelets. So what happens for us now? Because now we see that this is how a, a, a blood tube would be after it's been separated. Then how do we get this plasma and how do we get serum? So what we do usually, we collect blood in um, evacuator tubes. So depending on what is in that evacuator tube. So the most uh, sample that we get, which is serum. So when do we get serum? So we get serum if we have let the blood to clot. So that is why we say serum will not have any clotting factors because those clotting factors will be used up during that clot formation that will be formed in a tube. And then when you spin it down, then that liquid part, we will call it serum because it has no clotting factors because they are used up. And then how do we get plasma? So with plasma, we get it from the blood that is collected in a tube that contains an anticoagulant. So it means that blood does not clot. So that's why in plasma, you will still get all the clotting factors because clotting was prevented by that anticoagulant that is inside the tube. So that, those are the difference. With serum, the, the blood has to clot first and then when you spin down, you got that liquid part will be serum because all the clotting factors are used up during the clotting uh, process. And with plasma, the blood does not clot because in the tube, there is an anticoagulant that will prevent the clotting process to take place, which will result in plasma. So basically, that's what is the difference between plasma and serum.
so that is the blood sample that we would usually um get so now what are those evacuator tubes that we would usually use so i will um talk about them as they follow each other in the order of draw because the order of draw as well is very important if let's say different tests are requested that uses different tubes then the sisters or the phlebotomists they have to follow a correct order of draw so that we minimize any contamination that can happen between the tubes which can also cause aromas um, results but we'll deal with the limitations after um in the next video so this is how the tubes they look like so these two so this one is a plain tube so by plain it means it's plain there's nothing in it there's no anticoagulant there's nothing so if your blood is collected in this tube which is a plain tube it means now your blood will clot because there's nothing like automatically when blood is outside the body it clots it's, that's how it, it's natural it's like that so automatically so your blood will clot and then after spinning down a sample that will be in this tube you will get serum and then this red one uh, it's also a plain tube but this one it contains a clot activator on the on the inside i'm not sure if you'll be able to see it in the video you will see there is those dot dots dots there on the inside so basically that's your clot activator so this clot activator i think um what um its um responsibility will be to make sure that when you collect your blood in here it will clot quicker than the blood that is collected in a plain tube but still from these two you will get a serum so your blood will clot and then there's also an sst serum separator tube so sst stands for serum separator tube so this is the mostly used one so in the serum separator tube what is in here there is um silica particles so the silica particles as well they also activate clotting and again in the sst there is also a gel so what's nice about this sst is that um as soon as you spin down the sample the cells the, uh, will be separated from the plasma so there won't be any um effect on your results due to cellular exchange so that's why most of the time in a chemical pathology lab you will see these tubes so these um tubes are used mostly or the sample from the SST tubes are the ones that are used mostly in the chemical pathology lab. So when we talk about the order of draw, so it means now the phlebotomist will start will I will start with the plain tube, or if they're using the the, the, the red tube, which will the one that has a clot activator, and then they can collect the SST. So in these three, if you can remember, there is serum, and then the next one to follow it will be a heparin tube so this heparin tube from it we get plasma because heparin is an anticoagulant so what heparin um does it's, it exhalate accelerates the action of antithrombin 3 which will neutralize thrombin and does uh, prevent a, a fibrin clot from forming so at the end you're not going to have a clot so that's why when you spin down this tube, you are going to get plasma. So this tube, we can use it as well for the most widely used um, or requested chemistry test. But we most of the time, the preferred sample will be the SST, but you can use this one as well. So this is heparin. So it means after collecting all those um, serum tubes, then the heparin tube will be the one to follow. And then after the heparin, then we will get um, the EDTA tube, which is this purple tube. So this EDTA as well tube will lead us or will give us plasma as well because EDTA as well is an anticoagulant. So what does EDTA do? EDTA, it binds to calcium permanently and calcium, it is needed in the clotting process for the clotting to take place. So if the calcium is bound, then the blood can clot. So that's why at the end of the day, we'll be left with a uh, plasma. So then the one to follow will be the EDTA. And the other one, the last tube that we'll usually receive in a chemical pathology lab, it's a fluoride tube. The fluoride tube, it is a gray top. And as well here, we're gonna get plasma because this fluoride tube, it has potassium oxalate 
as well, which is an anticoagulant. But another nice thing about this tube is that it contains fluoride. And what fluoride does, it prevents glycolysis. So that is why it is the mostly preferred sample to test for glucose. So that is the fluoride tube. So if I were to hold all the tubes according to their order of draw, they should look like this. So basically, this is how they are supposed to follow each other from the plain tube up until the fluoride tube so that we prevent contamination as much as possible. So this is very important. You will see in the next video when we do the, the, the limitation, how the results of a patient can be um, affected and how incorrect results can be given to the doctor and the patient may be treated incorrectly, which might lead to death sometimes so it's very important to follow the correct order of draw when the samples are collected so basically that is the blood sample so if we can write it down we said the first one will be the plain tube will be the sst the serum separated tube and then heparin tube the EDTA tube and the fluoride tube. So that's how they will follow each other. So like we said, these ones, they bring serum because the, the, the clotting factors are being used up during the clotting process. And then these ones, they will give us plasma. So how are these samples processed? for us before we can be able to analyze them. So what happens is that as soon as the sister or the phlebotomist has drawn the, the sample or blood from the patient, so what happens is that uh, with the, the serum tube or the SST or the plain tube, we have to make sure that we let it sit for about plus minus 30 minutes so that the blood can clot completely. So if the blood can clot completely, it will give us a better result. And then after the blood is clotted completely, then we centrifuge it at a speed of 3000 RPMs. It's urine. So with urine, you can either receive a random urine or a timed urine. So by random urine, it's urine that will, they will usually collect in the container like this. So in, in, in most of the time, there is no preservative in it. So it's random as the word says. So you just go to the clinic anytime, any day. You just get there. You give them your symptoms and everything. And then they give you the container. You go and pee in this container. So basically, that's what we mean by random urine. And then they will bring it into the laboratory. We'll talk about its processing. And then another um, type of urine, it will be timed urine. By timed urine is that urine that will be taken for a specific period of time. Let's say, for example, if you your doctor wants to perform a creatine clearance on you. So what's going to happen is that you will collect your urine for a period of 24 hours in one bottle. So they will usually give you a 5 liter bottle. Let's see if I'll be able to. Uh -huh. So they will give you a 5 liter bottle that um, more or less looks like that. And then you will pee in this bottle for 24 hours. And then after the 24 hours, then that's when you will bring it back into the laboratory and then they will take it from there into processing it. So those are the two different urines. So with the urine that is um, a random that will be collected in this, it has to reach as well the lab as soon as possible. And then it must be transported in a, say in a uh, cooler or colder environment so that we can prevent glycolysis and the um, bacteria into growing in it so that it can reach the lab as soon as possible. And then when it gets to the lab, because it's in this container, what we would do, we would usually aliquot the urine 
that we get into this um, tube into this container into tubes because the instruments or the analyzers in the analyzers we can only fit in the tubes so what is that process of aliquoting so when you aliquot it's very important to always write the name of the patient on that aliquot tube and then also stick in the lab um, or requisition number that will the same requisition number that will be on this container so that it will represent this patient. So when you aliquot number one, you will So you'll be having a tube like that, then you will write the name and the requisition number of the patient. So the same thing that is written here, it must be the same that will be written on your aliquot tube. So that we will call an aliquot tube or a secondary tube. And then after doing that, then you will use a pasture, a pasture pipette. You will use a pasture pipette to aspirate a certain volume of this urine and then into the aliquot tube. And then you will close your lid of your aliquot tube. And then depending on usually, actually it does not depend on the test, all urine samples that has received in a chemical pathology laboratory, what you will do now, you will centrifuge it for 15 minutes at 3000 RPMs. And then you will take it or add to the appropriate bench or to where that a sample is supposed to be analyzed. And another thing that I forgot to mention, the very, very first thing before you aliquot, you must mix the urine before using the pasture pipette. So you must mix your urine first, take your pasture pipette to aspirate that certain volume, and then into your aliquot tube. And then basically you'll be having your aliquot, and then you take it to the appropriate um bench or analyzer that needs to to run that specific test that is requested on that urine so basically that's how you will process your random urine samples so now let's talk about processing timed urine okay before processing timed urine eh, um there is uh, something that is important certain tests for timed urine because you take them for a long period of time they require um in a, a preservative so that what the reason why we have that preservative is to make sure that whatever analyte that we are going to analyze is preserved so whatever result that we'll be getting from the analyzer will be a representation of what is happening in the patient's body so that's why we need that preservative so you, the test that we will, will usually request on a 24-hour urine is the creatinine clearance i would say is the cc so the creatinine clearance usually there's no preservative so you don't need any preservative for your creatinine clearance so you just get your bottle then you just pee in it then if you started today at 10 the next day at 10, you will end 
and then you take your bottle to the depot so that the sample can be sent to the lab to be analyzed. That's creatinine clearance. And then we have the, the CMP, calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. So if the CMP or the calcium, magnesium, phosphate test has been requested on a 24-hour urine, so what you do, you need to have a preservative, which is HCl, which is the hydrochloric acid. So what happens here is that when you are going uh, to that depot, after your doctor has written um, a request, Form for you that you need to perform a 24 hour um, CMP test on you. What, you. what they will do, the sisters, they will give you a bottle. In that bottle, they, that five liter bottle, they will put in 20 ml of hydrochloric acid. Then they will tell you, remember, acid can burn you, so that you make sure that every time when you, you transfer urine in there, you don't like with men, you don't put in your private part in there because you can burn. You can use other alternatives that will guide you on that. So that HCL, it is required for the CMP because after a long period of time, the calcium or the magnesium or the phosphate that is in there, it tends to clump to one another and then they dissociate out of the solution. And then if there is not that HCL in that bottle, by the time, after that 24 hours, we are going to test for that calcium or for that magnesium or for that phosphate in that urine, we won't find anything. So we're just going to find a false low result. And that low result won't represent what is in your body. So that is why it's very important for this HCL to be put into that 24-hour bottle at the beginning of the collection not at the end of the collection because when you put it at the end of the collection already the damage has been done for that period of 24 hours the clams the cm the cast the cmp has already dissociated out of the solution so that is why sometimes you'll find that in the laboratory they reject these samples they'll say ah this sample did not contain any preservative and the reason for that you don't want to send out false low results to a patient because now you're going to mislead the doctor there's no point so that's why the sample will be rejected and then a recollection will have to take place so it's very important to prevent time to and and as well thinking for the patient it's not nice like to to watch yourself like making sure that whatever whenever you pee your pee must go into the bottle for a period of 24 hours and then now you have to do it again because somebody didn't do their job properly. So that 20 mil HCL is an essential. It has to be there. There is a reason at the beginning of the collection. And usually the other test that they will request as well that um, requires a preservative for a tanned urine, it will be urate, or you can call it uric acid. So for uric acid, you need sodium hydroxide as a preservative at the beginning. For the same reason, if you can think about, if you know what kidney stones are, you will see that CMP and urate, they're the culprits in most of the time of forming um, kidney stones is because they have the ability of coming together to form a crystal. So that's why now we want to prevent that from forming in urine because if it does, then you're gonna get a false low result, which then the doctor might think uh, maybe something is not wrong with the patient or try to start thinking of other things um, unnecessarily. So it's important to make sure that these preservatives are there. And then as well, so once we have received this sample, because we will receive them in a five liter, so how we will process them, it will be the same way we will make an aliquot into these containers and as well into an aliquot tube, but still we need to put it in an analyzer. And an analyzer can only take a size of a tube, so we'll also aliquot it. So the aliquoting steps will be the same for a random urine and a, a, a timed urine. But what is important with these two, if, uh, by the time the sample gets to the lab, before adequating, what we do, we measure the pH. Because if HCl is an acid, and then if that urine that you got for CMP had acid in it, this preservative, then you know the pH has to be between one and, uh, 0 and 3, depending on what you're using. Others say 1, 2, 3, or 0, 2, 3, if there's anything like that. But it has to be less than 3. Then you know that there was an acid in it. 
and then with uh, sodium hydroxide sodium ultra hydroxide it's a base so obviously then your ph is going to be high above seven then you will know that seven uh, sodium hydroxide was present there but some laboratories they don't put this sodium hydroxide because they've made a study with urine, urine they did see that whatever even though you do get a false low but it has no clinical significance but for exam purposes make sure that you put that you will put a preservative that is sodium hydroxide in it so we will measure ph and then after measuring ph then you will start your aliquoting processes by naming uh, writing the name on the tube i'll um mixing and then aspirate a certain volume into the container the new um aliquot tube and then you will after that you close your centrifuge you take it to the appropriate um either bench or department depending on how your lab is set up for it to be able to perform that test so but then we do get um random urine for CMP as well, for calcium, magnesium, phosphate. If you remember, I did tell you that usually they don't put in any preservative in here because it's just a random urine. So in that case, then if it's a random, we can acidify because it didn't have that much time for it to, to form those strong molecular bonds together. So as soon as we acidify, we are able to break the bonds, unlike with a 24-hour urine. So how will you acidify? So it is acidification of urine. So what you will do, you will have to collect the whole. So if Already somebody had made an aliquot from this, then it means you have to collect that aliquot. So you must collect the whole urine. Urine, and then when you are done, you're going to mix. Measure the pH of the urine to check if it's not... um acidic and then most of the time usually with the random urine you'll find it you will have a normal ph of urine and then after getting that's a normal ph then it means you need to acidify so how will you acidify you're going to add a drop of hcl then you're gonna mix you mix it and then after mixing it you're gonna measure the ph You're going to measure the pH, and then if your pH is less than 3, then you're going to let it stand for 2 hours before you can start aliquoting. So you're going to measure the pH, and then if it's less than 3, then you're going to let it stand for 2 hours on a bench. Before aliquotting but if after you have measured the ph then your ph is greater than three then it means you're gonna go back to step number four so it means you, you it means you will keep on adding a drop of hcl up until you get the desired ph and please note you are not trying to dilute the urine so that is why you can't just and putting a lot of it add it drop by drop up until you get the correct ph by uh, in not diluting the, the urine in mind. Put in mind that you're not diluting the, the urine. So basically, this is how you will acidify your urine, your random urine that it is requested for CMP. Which a 24-hour urine, you cannot acidify. If upon res uh, receipt of that urine in the lab and the pH is greater than 3, then definitely you're just going to reject the sample and the recollection has to be... um. As a sample has to be recollected. So yeah, basically that's how um, you would process a urine sample as one of the samples that are received in a chemical pathology lab. And then the other sample type
that is received in a chemical pathology lab, it will be your stools. So we also receive stools, even though we don't receive them um, that much, but that's what we also receive. We can do it like usually they will request more um, osmolality, sodium and um, potassium. So with the stool as well, usually we will receive it in a urine container. They will put it in here. And then what we will do, we will aliquot it. So it means we will get a tube the same way with the urine. We will get a tube. Write the patient details on the tube and place a sticker of the lab number. And then we will take some stool from this container into the tube, close the tube, and then we will centrifuge it at um, 3000 RPMs for 20 minutes. So for the stools, we do it for 20 minutes, unlike the blood in the urine for 15 minutes. So we'll do it for 20 minutes. And then usually there will be that liquid bloody uh, liquidish water on top and then that's what we'll usually test so that's how but we don't get it much and then another sample type that we'll get it is the body fluids fluid and so on so we also do receive um these samples um and then we usually these samples are connected in a plain tube so a tube that does not have any preservative in it unless if glucose is requested on that specific preservative not preservative sorry a specific fluid then we will also um put it in a glucose tube because remember this fluoride tube like we said it prevents glycolysis so usually for fluids these are the two tubes that we'll do mostly it's the plain one unless the, the analysis of glucose is also requested then we will use this for a tube and then when we receive um, these tubes, we centrifuge them as well at 3000 RPMs for 15 minutes before testing them. And then we just use the supernatant to, to measure that analyte that a doctor has been, that a doctor has requested. And then, so basically that's it with fluids and fluids are very important. Option. All the sample types are very important, but these ones are very, 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 very important because they are collection. It's not um, really like an easy thing or a walk in a park. So as soon as we have these tubes, we have to make sure that we take care of it from the collection up until uh, the collection transportation and up until the analysis. We have to make sure that we take care of them so that... Um, we don't lose any bit of it sometimes we might find it that they send a little bit of it because it's a, a bit difficult to request or it's an invasive procedure to collect this tube for the doctor to collect this tube so they are very important the sample types so basically those are the samples that will usually be received in a chemical pathology lab and i guess you did enjoy this video and you've learned so much or as much as possible thank you very much for watching up until this far this is where i would like to end for today up until we meet on the next one may you please interact with me on the comments field if there's any question or there's any comment that you want to give please write it down on the comment field it will be very um nice for me to be able to interact with you and as well if you have any questions or if you need help with your board exam preparation for a chemical pathology at the special even if it can be in health i will leave my email address there at the bottom please get in touch with me i'll be happy to be able to assist you from me up until next time thank you